at Hope Covenant Church Online. We are so excited to be here with you, worshiping with you all around the country, all around the world this morning as we jump into the text of 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. But before that, I want to give you just a couple of announcements. Uh, if you find yourself close to the South Chicagoland area, we have a couple of events coming up. Uh, if you're a digital-only participant, that's okay. We're going to have things for you as well, and I have one of those as well. But um, if you do find yourself close to Chicago, we have a movie night and another trivia night coming up. Those can be found on our Facebook page uh, as events. So if you don't already like our Facebook page, make sure to do that to continue to get this content, to get content like Live at 5, which is a, uh, a kind of a mini sermon that happens every day at 5 o'clock live. Uh, to do our prayers uh, times on Wednesdays and our Stump the Pastors on Tuesday evenings as well as to sign up for small groups if that's something that you're interested in. All of that can be found through our Facebook or our website. And this week specifically, we have a really cool panel discussion, Stump the Pastors. We're going to be bringing in some guests to discuss with us a really important documentary that was just released by Netflix. It's called The Social Dilemma. And if you have a Netflix account, you can watch it. It's only 90 minutes long. Uh, and it talks about the impact of social media and the way that it's changing the way uh, and the outlook that all of us uh, take in. It's changing the way that we process information. It's changing the way that we see the world, that we love our neighbors. And so uh, because this movie is making waves and, and provides some really uh, synthesized information, um, we have decided to, to take Stump the Pastor time, extend it a little bit, and discuss social media and the church uh, kind of around that film. So watch it in, in advance of Tuesday and then log in 8 o'clock on Tuesday evening to Facebook or YouTube. Um, either one will be streaming it live and we will be having a conversation. If you have insight into that conversation, just post a comment um, and we will make sure to get to it. So that's an exciting, that's some exciting online things that we have going on. Like I said, we have some things in person. And, and I just want to remind you, if you're a person who's getting this email um, and you might not know a lot about Hope, uh, you can find all that information on, on our Facebook page or on our website, orlandhope.org. Um, and forward this email, forward this email to people in your life who need this content. Maybe they don't have a church home. Maybe it's been a long time since they've been at church. Maybe they're a person who's just interested in spirituality and this can be one of the resources that they consume on a weekly or monthly or whatever basis. Um, whatever it is, forward this to those people in your life. Uh, obviously, it has all the kids' content, which is great. We love our kids here at Hope, so um, if they could use that, maybe that's what, what it is. Maybe they'll get a, a word of encouragement this week from their email. So forward this email on so that people have access to this content. And if you'd like to support our ministry, I want to tell you how to do that. We haven't really talked so much about that. But our online folks are just as important as our in-person folks for supporting the ministry and the content that we're able to create to, to continue to give back to our local community and also our web community. Um, you can do so by going online. Again, our website's orlandhope.org and just clicking donate. There's also a donate link in your, or give now link in your email. Uh, it's a completely secure platform and even if you can just give $5 a month or something like that. It does not have to be a lot. Whatever it is goes back into be creating content so that you can be fed spiritually, so that you can clo grow closer to God. So if that's something, and, and we give back a lot of that to our community. We have people who come to us and say, hey, uh, I'm falling, I, I've fallen on hard times. You know, I'm, I'm, it's, I have a, an issue with the landlord or, or I'm back behind on my utilities, things like that. That is another significant thing that we support as well as our Beds Homeless Ministry, which we are right now working to get our building ready for that for next year post-pandemic, hopefully post-pandemic. So um, if you'd like to give, again, that link is orlandhope.org slash donate or orlandhope.org and click the donate link in the upper right-hand corner of our website. All of it's secure and we have a video on our YouTube that teaches you how to do that if that's something you'd like to do. But let's prepare our hearts for worship. Uh, we're going to have some great worship tunes, and I'm going to be back at you with a message from 1 Thessalonians. Please join us.
Wow, that was some great worship. That just gets me ready. It gets me excited on a Sunday morning to worship like that, to get ready for the Spirit, to get ready for the message. Let me pray for us, and then we're going to jump right into the text. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. You can start getting to your Bibles right now if you want to follow along. We strongly encourage that you do. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come before you uh, from all ar around this country, from all over the world. Lord, we know that some things are forged in the fires of adversity, that our online platform was forged in the fires of a pandemic, that we started doing this simply to get the message out to our people. Lord, we are so grateful and thankful that this message has spread, that this has become a resource for more than just the people in our local area, that people are growing closer to you all across this country. Lord, be with us today as we hear from your word, as we hear from the Apostle Paul, as we dive into the scriptures and look for those nuggets of wisdom that can affect and change our lives for the better today. Be with us, be with our hearts. If there's anything, Lord, that we're not ready to hear, prepare us in this moment to hear it. Lord, if it's, if it's a change in system that we need, be, be a system changer, be a chain breaker. If, it's, if there's something that we're being bondage to, Lord, whatever it is that, is that is affecting us in this moment, we ask that you would come into this space, that you would make a way for your word to once again do the holy work. Lord, you know, you have said it before when you say in Isaiah that your word does not come back empty. We lean on that promise today. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. A Men. So friends, I'm going to start, as we have been in this, in this uh, epistle series on Thessalonians, by just reading the text to you. If, if uh, I had a pastor in South Carolina who used to say, I always start by reading scripture. Now, I wish I took this advice all the time, but he said, I always start by reading scripture because if people tune me out after the first two minutes of my message, at least they got Bible. So here we go. Uh, starts chapter three, verse one. Um, hopefully uh, you will be able to follow along with us. I'm reading from the NRSV, which is what I preach out of. Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we decided to be left alone in Athens. We sent Timothy, our brother and co-worker, for God in proclaiming the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you for the sake of your faith so that no one would be shaken by these persecutions. Indeed, you yourself know that this is what, that what we are destined for. In fact, when we were here with you, we told you beforehand that we were to suffer persecution, so it turned out as you know. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent out to find about, sent out to find about your faith. I was afraid that somehow the tempter had tempted you, away from the and your labor had been in vain but timothy has now come to us from you and brought us good news of your faith and love he has told us also that you remember us kindly and that you long to see us just as we long to see you for this reason brothers and sisters during all our distress and persecution we have been encouraged about you through your faith for now we live and continue to stand firm in our lord we can we can how we can thank God enough for you in return for all the joy that we feel before our God because of you. Night and day we pray for you earnestly, that we might see you face to face and re restore whatever is lacking in your faith. Now may the God and Father himself of our Lord Jesus Christ on, uh, direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, just as we abound in love for you. And may he so strengthen in your heart, and may he so strengthen your hearts in holiness, that you might be blameless before God the Father and the coming of our Lord Jesus with all the saints. Amen. Friends, I'm sorry I am not the best reader, but that actually serves you because it means I can't read my sermons and I have to keep them up here. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> Apologize, I was tripping through that a little bit, but hopefully you got a little bit of what was going on here. Paul uh, is writing to the Thessalonians, and we are right now getting to the end of the introduction of his letter. I know that might sound strange because we're three weeks in and we're still talking about the introduction, but that should speak to you on, on what the power of Scripture is. The power of Scripture is that you can actually receive encouragement and good news 
and, and, and nuggets of wisdom even in a greeting, even in three chapters long introductions, we can still spend all this time on that because that is the kind of infinite wisdom. That's what makes scripture scripture and not something else. So as we come to the end of the introduction, Paul says two things. First thing he says is, hey, I was worried about you. I was worried about you because I wasn't sure how you were doing. We were facing all this persecution and we weren't sure if you were facing it too. We didn't know how you were handling it. I'm reminded kind of how the pandemic was when we first kind of got into this quarantine thing. We were calling people like, how are you holding up? How I'm holding up this way. How are you holding up? This is what Paul's doing. He's saying, I didn't know how you were holding up. It was not a good situation for us. We imagined it must have been hard for you too. But then he says, look, but Timothy, he, he came, he went to you and he came back to us. There was no FaceTime. There was no Snapchat. That's the way that uh, information was exchanged. People had to physically go. So Timothy goes, he comes back and he says, no, we were completely wrong to be worried. We didn't need to be worried at all. They're standing firm in their faith. In fact, they're, they're abounding in their love for one another. They're growing in their love for one another. And Paul says, that, that has just made our day, it's made our month, it's made our year. Like this is so awesome that all of our work was not in vain. And then he, just as he gets to the end, he starts, he starts to theologize just a little bit. Just as we get to those last two verses, and I'm gonna read them in a different translation. I'm gonna read them in the NLT because I think it really drives home. Sometimes the NRSV, because it's a literal translation, we can get tripped up by the way in which the Greek is being translated into English, which is why I like to read multiple translations. And this one in the NLT um, is really helpful for understanding the kind of the point of what he's saying in the last two verses. He says, May the Lord make your love for one another and for all people grow and overflow, just as our love for you overflows. May he, as a result, make your hearts strong, blameless, and holy as you stand before God our Father and the Lord Jesus when he comes again with all his holy people. Amen. Do you hear that? He's starting to talk about theology. He's starting to talk about praxis. And that's the thing. He uses the end of the introduction both, wait, I have to say this right, both in form and function to actually match the theology they're about to present. I don't expect any of you to understand what I just said because I don't understand what I just said. Um, I wrote that and I realized this is not a clear way to say it. So instead, I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story. And it takes me back to high school, which frankly was not that long ago for me. I'm only on my 10 year anniversary uh, from graduation recently. Um, I think actually my son, Oliver, was born. I realized this on the 10 year anniversary of my last day of senior year. So uh, that'll give you some context for how far out I am. But when I was in high school, I was part of a high school ministry, very similar to the ministry that I helped to facilitate here uh, for our in-person audience. And we're, we're developing uh, digital work for that too. So if you're in high school and you're, you're from a distance, um, we are developing a discipleship group for you as well. So just, that's a little bit of a teaser. But um, when I was in high school, I was in a group just like our group. And we gathered every single week to come around each other. We played games, we sang songs, and we dug into scripture in a, in a contextual and workable way for us. I had, I think, one of the best series of youth pastors that anyone has ever had. I had three youth pastors from the time I was really little up and through high school. And the, between the three of them, they are like the most amazing men of God that you have ever met in your life. Um, but one of them in particular was particularly awesome. Um, and he was such a welcoming presence at our youth group. We actually had an individual in our youth group who didn't believe in God. And why is this relevant? Because I think this gets to the heart of what Paul is saying here. So just stick with me. It did not stop us from making him feel like he belonged at youth group because our youth pastor led that way. Our youth pastor still treated him as though he was a full member of our group. He still invited him to sit 
with us during church. He didn't attend church because he didn't believe in God. He came to youth group. But, but if he ever did come to church for whatever reason, he was invited to sit with the youth, not off on his own. He was still allowed to go on every single mission trip. He was still allowed to go, if he desired, on the senior discipleship camp out. And it, none of this probably surprises you that we welcomed a person who didn't believe into our group, that we treated them like a full and equal member because you would imagine, you would expect for youth groups to do that. You would expect a youth pastor to do that. In fact, if a youth pastor was not doing that, you'd probably have a big issue with that youth pastor. But I want you to consider for a moment how problematic that is if we follow the theology that's so often presented by contemporary Christian culture. Contemporary Christian culture often casts non-believers into roles of villains and uh, general kind of conspirators in movies, right? Have you ever seen a Christian movie, a movie that is designed to be Christian? I'm not talking about a, a movie with Christian themes. Some of those are my favorite movies, but movies that are specifically, unashamedly Christian. I could, I could call out the studio that, that makes most of these, and you would know exactly what it is. I'm not going to do that. But, but the, we often in those movies, non-believers, people who are unsure of their faith, are cast as the villains, right? God's not dead. Great example. Who is the villain? Kevin Sorbo in that movie. He tends to be in a lot of these movies. He's the villain. Why? Because he's a non-believer. And all of the non-believers in that movie are seen to be crass, unmerciful, ungracious, arrogant villains. That's how Christian culture presents non-believers to us. Would you want that person influencing your high schoolers, even if they themselves were a high schooler? No, right? And even movies that don't go so explicit with that, movies like, uh, I think it's a recent one called like The Breakthrough or something like that, or Heaven is for Real, right? They still have this part of them where when a non-believer is presented in that form and function, in that, in that media, they are never a full character. They're monolithic. They can never contribute to the good outcomes of the film. They're always an antagonist. They're either supposed to be, the non-believers in our Christian films, converted or condemned. That's basically it. And until they're converted, they can't do anything good. They can't show repentance. They can't show love or grace or mercy. But our praxis did not match that theology. Because when we were faced with an actual human being on the other side, that human being did not fit the archetype or the stereotype of a non-believer to us. That person was just like any of us, still struggling. And, and if we're honest, all of us had doubts. All of us. That he was the one who was willing to admit it. To name his uncomfortability with some of the things that we say we believe, which are quite difficult to believe. We don't like it, but ultimately he was probably more honest about where he was than we were. He was, in some ways, the hero of our youth group because he called it like it was, at least for him. Our praxis assumed that people belonged even before they believed and contemporary Christianity really unashamedly says that people can never belong before they believe. They're never, they're never on the inside. They're never part of the crowd. Or they're always part of the crowd, but they're never part of the disciples, right? But of course, our contemporary Christian culture, when it does this, it fails to kind of deal with one semi-important document in the Christian church, namely the Gospels. And the epistles. Well, really all of the New Testament and most of the Old Testament. Because those documents actually portray a completely different understanding of belief. Right? So, so the three synoptic gospels, the, 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 the gospels that, that are all kind of the ones that tell the narrative history of Jesus. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Or Mark, Matthew, and Luke more accurately. Those three 
all tell a story where none of the disciples believe that Jesus is the Messiah until halfway through his ministry. In fact, all of them, if you look at them from a chiastic structure, which is a whole thing that you don't really need to understand, but if you look at the pinnacle moment in those stories where Jesus literally, physically, is walking away from Jerusalem and then turns and walks back toward Jerusalem, that moment when the journey stops being out and starts being toward the tomb, toward the cross, that moment is always when one disciple, specifically Peter, decides to believe. That means that half of Jesus' ministry, half of it, was to, was to encourage people that they belonged to him before they believed in him. This is the evangelism that the Bible gives us as an example. And in the same way, Paul spends almost half of this letter to the, first, the, to the Thessalonians, what we call 1 Thessalonians. Almost half of it making sure that the people of Thessalonica know, first and foremost, that he's thinking about them, that he cares about them, that he loves them, and that he's praying for them. That's it. He is uninterested in their doctrinal beliefs. He is uninterested in their theology. He is uninterested in how they, they identify Christ. The primary thing he is interested in. Now, he's not ashamed of how he sees those things. Don't hear that. But the primary thing he is trying to articulate to them is that he loves them. And then... In the end of the passage, in the end of the introduction, in the end of the third chapter, he gives you this very succinct discipleship pathway, and it's hidden. It's hidden. He says, I'm going to read it one more time, and I'm going to emphasize some words. Make the, and may the Lord make your love for one another and all people grow and overflow, just as our love for you overflows. May he, as a result, put, put, underline that, underline that, as a result, make your hearts strong, blameless, and holy as you stand before God the Father when our Lord Jesus comes again among all his people. So here's the discipleship pathway, right? Okay, make the, the, the I'm gonna, <laughs> getting into my crouch stance here so that I can really like, Trying to cut, this is my volleyball coach self coming out here, right? May the Lord make your love for one another grow and overflow as our love for you overflows. So, first, we loved you. Then, God helps you after experiencing the love of your church father, right? After experiencing the love of us, of the church, you then become the church and your love overflows for one another. That's first thing, for, for other people who agree with you. But then, number two, it overflows to everyone. For all people. And then, as a result of those, so first, we loved you. Then, you love each other. Then, you love the world. And then, as a result of that, your hearts may become strong and blameless. As you stand before God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ as he comes with all of his saints or with all of his people. Understand this is the process. As a result, you believe. First, you are loved. Then you learn to love. Then you learn to love people who are unlovable. The other, the villain, the outsider, all people. And then you believe. Then you will be made holy. As a result, you will be made holy. As a result, you will be made blameless. As a result of loving your neighbor, you learn to love God. John says it in a different way in 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. In case you were wondering. He says it in this way. I, those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers and sisters, are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love a God whom they have not seen. Do you see? When people say oh, it's about conversion, it's about your heart, it's about loving Jesus first, and then you'll love your brother and sister, 
John says, no, no, no. Paul says, no, no, no. Jesus says, no, no, no. He says, look, you have to love your brothers first. You have to love the world first. And then you can love a God that you haven't seen. But if you still hate your brother or sister, if you still hate the person from the other side of the political aisle, if you still hate the person whose skin color looks like this, if you still hate the person whose occupation makes them into this, if you still hate the person who prays differently than you or who is not of your religious framework or not of your denominational framework or maybe you hate me. I don't know who you hate, but if you hate anyone, you cannot love God. Period. But do you see the stark contrast in the way that Christians present ourselves in movies versus how what the Bible says we're supposed to do? It lays out our discipleship pathway that we're supposed to follow, but yet we still present what we call cheap grace. It's a Dietrich Bonhoeffer word. It basically means you believe with your head, but not with all the rest of it. We say, once you believe in Jesus, everything else will be perfect. Right? You were an abusive, vindictive womanizer, but then you said a prayer, great. You're completely fine. You have nothing to repent for. You're fine. Because you said a prayer once, you're, you'll be, you're just going to be blameless. You don't have to deal with all of that mess. Right? We know full well that discipleship process does not look, look that and you should not hear me discounting true, the true value of repentance. I, you, we have all heard the stories, right? The story of Paul is the story of radical one time I saw Jesus and then I just completely realized that everything, all the ways in which I was harming others was, were, were, were abusive and wrong and I shouldn't do those things. Yes, that happens. The problem is those stories are so often the ones that we say, oh, that's how it has to be for everybody or that is how it is for everyone or, 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 or if, it's, if it wasn't that way for you, then you're not really a Christian. It didn't stick, right? You backslid. Not you're on a discipleship pathway that, that means that it's going to take a long time for you to get through these things. Right? No, no, nobody goes through AA and says, okay, I, I, I admit that I'm an alcoholic and now, oh, I'm completely free from alcoholism. No, there's steps. Right? And that's a Christian, well, it's technically a non-religious, uh, non-denominational uh, religion uh, 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 group, organization. But it, it comes from very strong biblical Christianity. Understand that. They get it. They get it better than most Christians. Right? It's a process to learn to be a recovering sinner. Like, it's a process. It doesn't happen overnight. One prayer. I'm there. And if it does for you, mm, praise God. I'm so glad. But you're probably one out of a million. See, we focus our theological frameworks on a flawed version of evangelism. Today, it requires more service to get a merit badge in Boy Scouts than it does to find yourself on most church boards in the evangelical church. Because all of those churches, they say, no, 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 it's, it's important what you say much more than what you do. But thank God for Scripture, right? We started out just, hey, if you get nothing else, get Scripture, right? Thank God for Scripture because Scripture is so much more interested in the real discipleship pathway than it is the noise, than it is the one-time fun event, than it is the radical one-in-a-million conversion story road to Damascus blinding light thing. Scripture is concerned with a discipleship pathway for the rest of us that says, be loved. Learn how to accept love. Learn how to turn that around and love your neighbors within your faith community or within your, your neighborhood or whatever, the pe within your family, right? Then, then learn how to love people who find themselves outside of that family. And then, then you can learn to love God. 
then you can learn to be faithful. Then you can learn to have uh, perseverance in the face of persecution. Then all of these things. And it didn't say, Paul never said, you, you're complete in your faith. In fact, he says, I'm excited to come back to you. That's the verse that all of our kids are learning this week. Uh, you know, we pray for you constantly so that we, can, that we can come back to you and fill in the gaps in your faith, right? They weren't finished yet. Their theology was still underdeveloped. But Paul was so much more interested in what they were doing and who they were being than what they believed. So let us be a place. Let us be a place where belonging is a given to anyone who has the unmistakable courage to show up or click on a video posted by a church in a time where churches and their people are far more associated with hypocrisy and divisiveness and politicization and judgment than they are with love and welcome and wisdom and grace. Let us be like the churches of Paul who led with love. And then, then they got around to theology and belief. Let us be people who are willing to walk the first half of the journey with Jesus and not just skip to the empty tomb because it makes us feel good on Easter. Let us be people who love, who accept love, who give love, who expand in love, and eventually learn to love the almighty and all-gracious and all-loving creator of the universe who we have not yet seen. That, my friends, is the good news, and that is the charge for each and every one of us this morning, it's the charge for us tomorrow morning as we go to work. It's the charge for, or go to school or, or log into school or whatever that looks like today. It's the charge for us as we go from this place because it's a discipleship pathway that works and that's biblical. Not one that sells a lot of tickets in a lot of movie theaters and makes certain Christian bands very famous. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come to you, to be people who love, who, to be people who are given love, who show love, who expand their love, and yes, Lord, who believe. But Lord, let us not skip the first half of the story to get to the second. Let us walk a discipleship pathway that is not easy, that is hard, that is not quick, that is worth it. And let our evangelism become your kingdom here, now. Amen. Friends, go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the strength of the Spirit.